Hi oh, Sheila, it's good to see you. Hi Anne, good to see you again. Hello, happy birthday, Linda Camacho. Good to see you, Diane Steele. All right, well, it's time to uh, begin our study. So again, I'm just want to take this time to uh, welcome all of you to our Wednesday night Bible study. I know there are some who will join us uh, later on in the course of our study. Uh, tonight, we uh, continue our study through the Old Testament, and uh, we are going to uh, take a look at uh, uh, Solomon and, uh, uh, again, some of the uh, important uh, wisdom uh, writings that uh, he um, has uh, uh, authored for us uh, and so we are going to look at the book of Ecclesiastes and uh, we will uh, 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 pray God to help us draw some uh, important lessons from this study let's go to the Lord in prayer this time gracious Lord we come before you tonight with a very grateful heart to express our uh, thanks to you for the way you have loved us, the way you have provided for us, and the way you have protected us. We thank you, Father, for tonight, for bringing us all together to allow you to refresh us uh, through your word. Father, you are the living word, and so we pray that you will be with us tonight, that you will bless our, our discussion that you will impress the truth that you will have us learn and, uh, and, and, and gain uh, and apply to our lives. Father, give us that desire to be committed to your word. And give us that desire to share your word uh, with those who need to hear. We pray especially for our church family and for those who are not feeling well in, in body, mind, and spirit. And there are many of us, for those who need your special healing grace and healing touch at this time, Father, we ask that you will extend that hand to them. We remember in particular uh, Anne Garson, who just uh, came home from hospital. We also continue to uh, remember Barbara Brower and uh, Bob. We pray for uh, Ernestina and uh, Nelson Hall. Uh, Father, we uh, also pray uh, for... Uh, Karen as she uh, recovers uh, and many others whose names we are unable to uh, mention at this time. But Father, you know all of them and we ask that even as we pray, that you will visit with them individually and that Father power will move out of you and touch them. We also want to thank you for our members who are Father are rejoicing and uh, thanking you for some answered prayers. Uh, we join with them and we praise you for all those blessings. We also pray for those who need your special uh, blessing because of uh, some uh, spiritual uh, uh, issues that they may be facing or going through. Those with emotional uh, uh, issues, Father, you know all, all those uh, you know, you know, individuals and names. And again, we ask that you will be with them. We want to uh, pray especially for our country at this time. 
that Father, you will bless this great land in which we live and that you will continue to allow us to enjoy that freedom of worship that, uh, Father, you have blessed this country with. We pray for our elected officials and particularly as we go through this uh, season of, uh, of elections that, uh, Father, your uh, blessing will be upon this land, uh, that, Father, everything will be done smoothly in accordance with your plan, with your will. We also just want to pray for the uh, other parts of the world where uh, there are some uh, troubles and issues and and, uh, and people not having that freedom to exercise uh, uh, that, that worship of, uh, of, of their God. And Father, we pray that, uh, again, you will be with them. And so bless us together and bless our time uh, because we pray all these and we ask all these through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This will be a good time to uh, grab your Bible and turn with me to uh, the uh, book which um, the wise man wrote, uh, Ecclesiastics, also known as Koheleth, or the preacher, and we'll be looking at uh, uh, chapter 1 and uh, chapter 2. But before we do that, uh, please uh, just pull out your hand out and let's uh, look at the introduction to help us uh, situate our lesson in its context and also to... Uh, just help us uh, 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 just uh, pin down the exact points that we'll be covering for tonight's study. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, is credited with writing three Old Testament books of wisdom, some three wisdom books of the Old Testament, namely Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon. Proverbs has the feel of a father passing on his collected uh, wisdom to his son. And Song of Songs is a celebration of love in marriage. And so kind of in a, in, in, in a nutshell, in, uh, in a summary, uh, Proverbs seem to kind of suggest that feel of a, of, of a father uh, who is, uh, um, um, you know, has seen many years and uh, he has uh, gone through life and is passing on that uh, you know, wisdom, um, um, you know, a knowledge to uh, his son. And Song of Song is just about that celebration of, of love in marriage. But Ecclesiastics is different. It feels like a bitter old man expressing regret over a wasted life. That seemed to be the kind of first impression when you read through that book of Ecclesiastics. Tonight, we will see that while Ecclesiastics seem to have more in common with existentialist philosophy, you know, when we talk of existentialist philosophy, what we mean is that it su suggests uh, uh, kind of uh, that focus on why we're here, th th this life, and, um, you know, the way we live our lives, and, and how we probably can even do something to make this world better, or just, just go through this life without, you know, uh, really do anything, just looking out after ourselves and just making sure that uh, we uh, have the good life and, and, and that's the end of it. Uh, but if you look at this book carefully, you will see that the book Ecclesiastics is more than just something dealing with existentialism or that of how we exist, how we live in this life. It helps us to understand the limits of human wisdom. And it also shows us the futility, how futile the uh, pursuit of things in this world obviously uh, you know, is. It, it's, it doesn't help us to focus all our energies and everything on just pursuing uh, things of this world. We will further note that wisdom is the scale of living faithfully in God's world, even in our fallen human condition. In other words, wisdom will tell us that this is God's world, in spite of all the, the sins and uh, the, the problems, the tribulation, the suffering, the pain uh, that we have to endure, we have to go through. God is not, as I've shared with you before, an absentee landlord who just, you know, uh, uh, abandons his, uh, his household or, or his property and uh, he doesn't actually uh, take any more notice of it. God is very much involved in our world 
and God is the one who uh, makes this world uh, tick. He's the one who holds this world in his hands. He's the one who guides us. He is the one who brought this world into being and he's very active in this world. And so wisdom will show us, will demonstrate to us clearly that true wisdom is really the ability, not through our own strength, but through the power of God's Spirit to live faithfully in this world which God has given to us. And so rather than focusing on existentialist philosophy, we focus on how we can faithfully live in this world that God has created, how we can uh, uh, enjoy this world, and at the same time, take care of this world. Be mindful of uh, the world that God has made so that we don't destroy it, and that we will protect this world and also uh, uh, preserve it for a future generation. Uh, wisdom is not just only living through this world and uh, just uh, following God's you know, command, but wisdom shows us how to live and uh, it cannot save us. And so wisdom will point us to our need of a savior, Jesus Christ, God's given wisdom for this world. And wisdom will show us clearly that it is only through Jesus Christ, God's power and God's wisdom that we might be saved uh, in this world. Our salvation comes only through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so with that, let's uh, open our Bibles to uh, Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 1, and uh, I will read from verse uh, 12 to uh, the end of that uh, uh, first chapter. Please follow me in your Bible. The um, title of this uh, sub-session is The Vanity of Wisdom. I, the preacher, have been looking over Israel in Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after the wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I saw it in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to folly. I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and to know folly. I perceive that this also is but a striving after the wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Now these are very deep words of, of wisdom. I mean, even if we don't go to your uh, script and we just look at these uh, 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 verses, these words that are, we just read, you notice that they really point us to that true source of wisdom. The writer, the author, the preacher, the Kohaneth is saying that he has been king over Israel in Jerusalem, which indeed suggests that this is coming from uh, uh, you know, Solomon. In fact, when you read the very first verse of chapter 1, the verse of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. And so uh, the conclusion, obviously, is that Solomon is the, uh, the author or the one who wrote this. Even though it is not explicit, yet you can infer uh, from that. And so there are certain things in this that I would like us to uh, take notice of. But before we do that, let's just read the um, uh, first point from your handout uh, just to uh, help us uh, appreciate what we just read from Scripture. In the 4th century, 
Augustine of Hippo, North Africa, later known as St. Augustine, one of the uh, church fathers, at age 17 set out to find wisdom and fulfillment. And that shouldn't surprise many of us as young, uh, as a young man and as uh, many young uh, people do, you know, you think you have the whole world in front of you and uh, therefore you just uh, set out to enjoy life, to uh, you know, find wisdom and to find fulfillment. He embraced a hedonistic, dualistic religious philosophy, which uh, ridiculed his mother's Christian faith in favor of rationalism and promiscuous living. But Augustine, let us say Augustine, found no fulfillment in uh, pursuing uh, that kind of, uh, if you like, uh, fulfillment, enjoyment in this life, that hedonistic uh, you know, a way of life. And uh, he felt that his mother's Christianity or Christian faith was really something to be mocked, uh, something that uh, mom shouldn't even waste her time. And obviously, uh, Augustine should not uh, either. Instead, we discovered that he did not find wisdom. He did not find fulfillment in that um, uh, uh, kind of approach. Instead, he felt enslaved to his passions and struggled for freedom within himself. And that is true. History is awash with many, many people who try to uh, do just what uh, Augustine uh, set out to do in his youth. You know, we think that by pursuing life, by just enjoying life, working as much as we can, making all the money that we can, and just spending it, uh, having vacations, just buying all that we can, building all that we can, eating all that we can, and just having the good life. That will give us fulfillment. But many who have gone that route will tell you, and in fact, history is there to actually uh, you know, help us. They will tell you that it's, you know, all is not well with that approach. That life is more than just pursuing fulfillment or just that fleeting enjoyment of this world. And so here is what Augustine did. One day, Augustine heard a child chanting a playground jingle. Take and read. Take and read. And the child kept you know, kind of singing and enjoying uh, you know, uh, uh, himself or herself. And then Augustine just listened to that jingle and he went in home and he picked up a collection of Paul's epistles and was guided and I know God was guiding him to uh, read this verse in uh, Romans chapter 13 uh, verse 13 to 14 Romans chapter 13 verse 13 to 15 let me read that from my uh, Bible you have it in the um, uh, on the handout but this is what uh, Augustine read let us walk properly as in daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling or jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Let us walk, in another translation, with decency as in the daytime let us walk as in the light because when you are in the light you know that there are all eyes on you and so you behave decently and so let us walk with decency let us walk as we just read let us behave as if we are in the day and that's really important for us to understand we ought to walk not as people who are in darkness, but as people who are in daytime. In daytime, you walk, you know, you kind of walk straight. You look in front, behind, or whatever you're doing, you don't walk as if you are in the dark. And then he goes on to say, um, you know, in this walk, we do not do it in carousing and in drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or impurity, not in promiscuity, which is really what Augustine 
set up to find. Not in quarreling or in jealousy, but we ought to put on our Lord Jesus Christ. And we are not to gratify the desires of our flesh. We read that the desires of the flesh include all kinds of things. And so Augustine realized this. And uh, he knew that only by being wise and only by walking closely with his Lord would he be able to find that fulfillment, that, um, uh, if you like, uh, enjoyment uh, that he had been seeking and pursuing. In fact, according to history, this was a game changer for Augustine. You see, this is exactly what Solomon is talking about here. Solomon wants the reader, wants you and me and all of us to understand that everything is fleeting. Everything is like breath. Like a mist that vanishes. Even human life is like vapor. And of course, we ought to understand and to believe that life is under God's sovereign rule. But so often we live our lives as, as if everything is just what we see. All that is under the sun and so let us just make merry, enjoy ourselves for tomorrow we die. Well, this is not simply what this world and this life is all about. And so Solomon is saying that when we do those things, when we try to pursue just pure enjoyment, that physical enjoyment, we are, as it were, really seeing a mirage. If you have lived near the desert, when it's really hot during the kind of the midday sun, you will see some kind of, uh, you know, shimmering out there in the distance. And as you try and get close to it, it kind of goes farther and farther away. It's what we call a mirage. You see it, but you cannot reach it. You cannot grasp it. And that is what, you know, Solomon is saying to us here. And so let me read that again. It's, you know, in verse 13 of uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is under the sun all that is under the heaven. Solomon attempted to seek and to search out by wisdom, through wisdom, all that is under the heaven. And in fact, having experienced that, Solomon says, don't even bother. Don't even attempt. Why? Because it is an unhappy business. It is something that is futile. It is something that is fleeting. It is something that is a mirage. It is something that you cannot, uh, you know, grasp. And so he says, it is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. All the busyness. You know, um, as you know, I come from Ghana. And uh, uh, we, we have some kind of saying in Ghana that uh, people go abroad and uh, that's Ghanaians and they work hard which is good but they work so hard and uh, you know they try as Solomon is saying to acquire all that is there for them maybe they will work hard get some money come home build you know a nice house keep working and they forget even to take a break to just rest this body and uh, the saying is that most of them, those homes become, uh, you know, graveyard for them. In other words, they just can't even enjoy the fruit of their labor. And they actually come home, uh, you know, uh, dead bodies uh, to be buried. You know, when we begin to focus on wisdom, when we begin to focus on all that we can amass and acquire in this world, and exclude God, the one who gives us strength, the one who gives us the breath of life to live, the one who protects us, 
and the one who provides for us, we are making a very sad mistake. And so Solomon continues in verse 14. I have seen everything that is done under the sun. Literally, as an old man, he's seen everything. You know, I have a 16-year-old boy in my home, and as all 16-year-old boys think, he knows everything. Daddy and mommy don't know anything. And so when something happens and we're talking, oh, daddy, that's so simple. This is how you do it. You see, that 16-year-old mind sees things in binaries, only in black and white. He forgets that there are shades of gray in between because that's how a 16-year-old mind works. Now, Solomon is saying, oh, I have seen everything that is done under the sun, which means we need to straight it up. We need to listen. We need to heed these words of wisdom and admonition coming from Solomon. He's saying that I have seen everything done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. You know, you can see the wind blowing. You, you know, you don't really see the wind itself. But what you see, you see some movement. And then you see the destruction of the wind. In other words, you cannot touch it. Just like the mirage. You can't hold it. And Solomon is saying that, I have seen everything done under this uh, sun, under this heaven, in the world. And behold, all this vanity and it feels like chasing after the wind tonight my christian friend this gentleman solomon is offering us some words of admonition and comfort solomon is saying and let me go back to my notes here that we believe that all life is under god's sovereign rule but we often live as as if Life is all under the sun. And all that there is is just what we see around us. And so, Solomon is saying that life is like a vapor. And let me go to the book of James. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to that uh, wise man uh, also uh, who wrote something for us. In James chapter 1, uh, in James chapter 4, verse 14, James chapter 4 and verse 14, uh, James actually uh, writes this for us. James says, Yet, let me start from verse 13. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go out into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time. And then it vanishes. That is the same way that Solomon is saying, you know, wind, a mist. You see it, you know, in the morning, but as soon as the sun comes out, it kind of disappears. And so our life is just like that mirage, just like that wind, just like that mist. You know, life is more than what we see in this world, under this sun. There is more to life. And so Solomon is saying to us, when we focus on the pleasures of this life, the enjoyment, that hedonistic lifestyle, it is like trying to chase after the wind. It is all futile. And so in the book of in the book of Job. Let's go back to the book of Job and just read Job chapter 7 and verse 16. Job chapter 7 and verse 16. And we know the book of Job offers us, it's also one of those uh, wisdom books that Charles read from the beginning. Um, Solomon is repeated to our reading. And so in Job chapter 7 and verse 16, this is what we read. I loathe my life. I would not live forever. Leave me alone for my days are a breath. My days are like a mist. That's what he's saying. My days are like just that wind. Job knew that. 
Job saw that. And so, you know, uh, Solomon is saying to us that wisdom, all that kind of energy, all that scheming, all that planning, apart from faith, always flounders. Wisdom without true wisdom from the, the one who gives, you know, divine wisdom, which is Jesus Christ himself, flounders. It always disappoints. It always frustrates. It always leaves us wanting more. Because it's like that wind, that mist, which you cannot reach, which you cannot take hold of. You know, that is life. And some of us are so consumed with that, that we chase after that wind, that mist, to our own detriment, to our own destruction. There are so many people in this life who have done that and have just ended up in a very bad place. Tonight, the wise man is offering us this great, great wisdom that everything we do in this life apart from faith in God always flounders. It disintegrates. It doesn't come to anything. It always disappoints us. When you put your life in material wealth, in material prosperity, you know, it doesn't end forever. If you put your whole confidence in your own strength and intellect, in your uh, business kind of acumen and sureness, it also will disappoint you because it never lasts forever. In fact, it leaves us wanting more. The reason is simple. True wisdom is made for more than the things of this world. It is made to draw us to the one who created this wisdom. And so tonight, Solomon is telling us about the futility of human wisdom. Yes, we can be wise in our own thinking, in our own minds, in our own kind of, uh, you know, self aggrandizement or just thinking highly about ourselves, maybe because you have money, because you're smart, because you are beautiful, handsome, you name it. But Solomon is telling us that it's all fleeting. It's all like a wind, or like the wind, it's all like the mist. You know, true wisdom is to know the one who made this world, to know Jesus Christ, and to love him with all your life. In fact, Solomon continues, and let me read uh, in uh, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 3 of Ecclesiastes. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure, enjoy yourself. But behold, this all also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? I search with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under the, the heaven during the few days of their life. He's saying to us, why do we even, you know, try and be even happy in this world? That's what he's saying. Why do laughter and pleasure fail to satisfy us? Well, because we're looking at them in the wrong way. You see, does God disapprove of laughter and happiness? Absolutely not. Does God frown on our smiling? Absolutely not. He is for, you know, all for our enjoyment. God wants us to be happy. Beloved, above all things, I want you to be prosperous. I want you to be successful. God wants us to be the head, not the tail. He wants us to be the first, not the last. And he is prepared to grant us the success that we need. But, that should not mean that we run ahead of God and do things in our own way to make ourselves successful. You see, we are to enjoy God and enjoy what God has provided. The problem for Solomon and for many of us today, 
was and is that we are viewing pleasure and laughter and enjoyment and fulfillment as ends in themselves. Enjoyment is an end in itself. Pleasure is an end in itself. But we know that is not the case. You see, laughter and cheer are always intended to lead us back to God, the author of joy. You know, when we fail to connect our joy with the giver of that joy, it's not just a problem, but in fact, it will lead to wickedness. And again, let me go to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 10. The book of Proverbs chapter 10. And let me uh, read uh, verse 28. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 28. The hope of the righteous brings joy, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. The hope of the righteous brings joy, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. You see, we participate in this wickedness when we seek enjoyment, when we seek uh, pleasure in things apart from God. When we seek enjoyment and pleasure apart from God, we are, as it were, perpetrating this wickedness. We become part of this wickedness because God's plan and God's purpose for our lives is to find happiness in and through none other than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In fact, I want to propose to you, all of you tonight that true enjoyment will always be sourced in God alone. God is the true source of enjoyment in Him and it shows us that in God and in what He is, we find true fulfillment. Again, in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 13, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 13, the wise man again uh, writes the, fol the following for us. Uh, in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 13. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. Blessed is the one who finds true wisdom. You see, without union with God as the source of pleasure and glorifying Him as the goal of pleasure, we are left asking ourselves the very same question that Solomon asked. And that is in Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 2. I said of laughter, it is mad. And of pleasure, what use is it? What does all this accomplish? What use is pleasure? What use is laughter? What use is all these you know, resources, wealth, riches that I have amassed for myself if they are you know, uh, without uh, you know, any relation to God? Solomon said, they all avail nothing. Tonight I want to share with you that true wisdom is found in none other than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and see what Paul tells the church in Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 7 and verse 13. Do not be idolatrous as some of them were. And it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That hedonistic lifestyle. The people sat down to eat, to drink, and they rose up to play. If I continue verse 8, we must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did and 23,000 fell in a single day. Again, true wisdom is not to enjoy or to be involved in sexual promiscuity. That's sexual in immorality. In fact, in verse 31 of uh, chapter uh, you know, 10, let's go to uh, that uh, last but two verses. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. You know, that is true wisdom. 
Many people have made shipwreck of their lives because they were not wise. Or, if you like, they just went by the wisdom of this world. But there is a fundamental difference between God's wisdom and the wisdom of this life. And that will be the last part of our study. So let me read from Ecclesiastes chapter 2, beginning at verse 4, and then ending at verse 11. Please go to the scripture with me. Chapter 2, beginning at verse 4. I made great works. I built houses, planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks, planted in them all kinds of uh, all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had ever been before me in Jerusalem. Verse 8. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of the kings and provinces. I even got singers, both, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of men. You know, this wise man is saying, look, what is it that I, you know, I, would not, I didn't get? I got everything. I had literally everything. And then he goes on in verse 9. And so I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. In other words, you saw as his father David did, walking on the roof, out of his couch and just enjoying that evening breeze and then his eyes kind of locked onto this beautiful woman or Bathsheba and he, you know whatever his eyes found he went after it and we know the end result as we learned from our last you know sermon on last Sunday and so Solomon is saying whatever his eyes found and they were pleasing to him he got them and then in verse you know 10b I cut my heart from no pleasure for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil that I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind. And there is nothing to be gained under the sun. You know, this, I believe, should help us to reflect on this true wisdom that only God can give us. Solomon is saying to us, I have been there. I have experienced it all. I have done it all. I have tasted all of that. My eyes have seen everything. In fact, I became so great that none could surpass me in Jerusalem. My wisdom remained with me and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold, I just went after it. My heart found pleasure in all my toil. And then he comes to the end of it all and he says, all was vanity, a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. My Christian friend, this is a very sad state of affairs. But for most of us, we don't learn. We keep going. We keep working. We keep amassing all that we can. We keep just, you know, uh, accruing and doing everything we can without even sometimes paying attention to our bodies and without just having time for our God, the one who made us and the one who gave us the strength. And so here's Solomon. 
Solomon said, I've, uh, you know, I've done it all. And so maybe um, we can say, as we say in our cultural maxim today, I have to do what's right for me. So Solomon, if that maxim is true, that in, as in our culture, let me do what is right for me. It's all about me. You know, uh, as we say, uh, each for himself, God for us all. And so I have to just get all that I can, all for myself. If Solomon had actually uh, 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 you know, followed that maxim, Solomon should have been the happiest person ever uh, on earth. But he wasn't. None of his accomplishments, none of his achievements, none of his acquisitions satisfied him. In fact, we just read, all was vanity and a striving after wind. And he concludes with this dismal statement, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Even these lined the path of futility. His accomplishments, his achievements, his acquisitions, all that, all that kind of, uh, you know, uh, woman that he had, the concubines and the, the wives, it, they all could not satisfy Solomon. But centuries after Solomon, ladies and gentlemen, centuries after Solomon, one of Solomon's descendants, Jesus Christ, would show the world the different true path to fulfillment. And that is through himself. Thank God. Although King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Creator of all, Jesus was born in a stable. The one who had it all, more than Solomon, yet he chose to come into our world, into our lives, to save us through that humble birth in a stable. The owner of a cattle on a thousand hills, as we read in the book of Psalm 50, he did not even have a place to lay his head. His joy and his pleasure and his fulfillment were to do the work of his father, to be obedient to his father. And so, in one of the most beautiful psalms ever, uh, you know, uh, hymns that has ever been written for us and I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 2 Paul's letter to the Philippians chapter 2 and I'll read from verse 4 to verse 11 this is about Jesus Christ and I want you to pay attention to what brought joy what brought fulfillment nothing but his accomplishments nothing but his achievements nothing but all the acquisitions it was all about what he did for humanity, for you, for me, for all the world. And so that was Jesus' joy and his fulfillment. Let's go to you know, Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 4, and then read all the way to verse 11. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And that is the beginning statement. So we are all admonished and cautioned and encouraged not to look after our own interest, but also the interest of other people. And we have a paradigm, we have a model, we have an example. So here is what Paul tells us. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on 
the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that name that is above every name so that and I get goosebumps when I get to this part so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth and every tongue confers that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father hallelujah hallelujah this is true wisdom my Christian friend this is the humanity that we are talking about Jesus found true joy and true fulfillment in humbling himself, going the way of the cross, dying for all mankind so that you and I, all of us, will have eternal life. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 12, let me read this important verse. Hebrews chapter 12 and uh, that uh, beautiful verse, Hebrews chapter 12. And go to Hebrews. Just bear with me. Hebrews chapter 12. And let me read verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus, your Lord, my Lord, the King of kings, the creator of this world, the Lord of lords, he humbled himself. He went the way of the cross. He died on your behalf, on my behalf, so that we will have the opportunity to be saved. In fact, tonight, I want to agree with Paul that in light of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, there is none other, there is no other than Jesus Christ who is truly the power and the wisdom of God. Yes, Jesus, the wisdom of God demonstrates forever that God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. It is through Jesus Christ the one whom the world scoffs at and believes to be of no consequence that God has provided salvation for all who trust in him. And so, let me read our last scripture reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And let me read from verse 24. Uh, and then I will read verse 25. 1 Corinthians 1, 24. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. For consider your calling, brothers and sisters, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards, but many were, not many were powerful, but many of you were of noble birth. But God shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Jesus Christ, ladies and gentlemen, the power and the wisdom of God. Tonight, if you didn't hear anything at all in our discussion, don't forget 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 24. Jesus Christ, the power of God. Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God. You know, salvation is found and, you know, salvation and fulfillment are found in no other 
They are not found in wisdom. They are not found in pleasure or in possessions, but they are found in that one power and that one wisdom of God. And his name is Jesus Christ. This is true wisdom. Tonight, I pray and I wish that you and I and all of us will go to the source of true wisdom, Jesus Christ. Solomon lived it all. He saw it all in his accomplishments, in his acquisitions, in his achievements. And he came to that conclusion that all is vanity. I have expended in doing all of it, and behold, all is vanity. All is just a mere striving after wind, and there is nothing to be gained under the sun. The only thing that we can gain is when we come to that true wisdom of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Father, thank you for the wisdom of Solomon. Making that clear distinction between human wisdom and divine wisdom. Tonight we recognize you as the Lord the creator, the king of kings, the true divine wisdom. Solomon has shared with us that he experienced all of it and he expanded all of it. And in the end, the conclusion was unmistakable. All is vanity, a striving after wind. And there is nothing to be gained under the sun. The only thing that is worth our pursuit is to come to the one who is the power and the wisdom of God, Jesus Christ. And so tonight I pray, oh God, that you will guide us to that true source of wisdom, Jesus Christ our Lord. For it is in his name and for his sake we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for being a part of our Wednesday night Bible study. I hope you were truly blessed. A son learns true wisdom. And I hope that you and I will learn this true wisdom from our God, Jesus Christ. Stay well. Stay safe. And I look forward to sharing God's word with you again this Sunday as we come together. If you're unable to join us in person, you can still watch it uh, on our Facebook um, uh, site there. And so... Uh, we pray, God, that God will keep all of us uh, well for us to enjoy that blessing. Uh, share this blessing with your family, uh, with your friends. Just let them know how much God loves them. Thank you, Anne, and thank you, everybody.